Hey, good morning, Sherbrook Church. Good morning, Peace Church on 52nd. We're so glad you're here. Welcome here to church. All week long, we're paying attention to Jesus. And then Sunday morning, we gather together and respond in wonder and worship and sing together. So welcome here. Psalm 96 says, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the field and forest shout for joy. So let's pray together. God, thank you that we can gather together as two sister churches. Thank you for the unity that comes only through you. Thank you for your, that your presence is here right now. We invite you to change us all as we submit to your spirit together as one church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Raising up 
Matthäus, Kapitel 5, Vers 3. Selig sind die, die geistlich arm sind, denn das Himmelreich ist ihnen. Bienaventurados los pobres en espíritu, porque de ellos es el reino de los cielos. Se maumi ganan samen boki itta. Hanen naraga kudere koshita. Today's scripture comes from Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for though they persecuted the prophets who were before you. These are the words of the Lord. Well, good morning. And Jesus began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you picture successful people, who would they be? Are they multi-billionaires, movie stars? sports heroes, great writers, famous musicians, people with several PhDs or famous scientists. Perhaps you're a little more, perhaps a little more modestly, you would think of a person with a prestigious job, a large home with a garage with several expensive cars and kids that are popular and good at school. Well, maybe you're reminding yourself Oh, I'm at church, so I'd better be more spiritual. But honestly, what is your measure of success, your definition of the good life? What goals or hopes or dreams do you have for yourself, your children, or your grandchildren? I was driving with a good friend of mine when he, we start, he started talking about his university days. He said that he used to ride to UBC with three other guys, all church attenders. One day they started talking about who would be the most successful in life. He said they all agreed that it would be art. And then he said, we were right. Art eventually went to Harvard for his MBA and then became a really successful realtor. So I asked, is making a large amount of money the measure of success? And he, a Christian, responded, well, of course. What else would it be? What else would it be? You, of course, now be honest with yourself. You might massage your definition of success a little more subtly. But how much of your view of success and the good life is influenced by the culture around you. Would being spiritually poor, mourning, being meek, hungering for righteousness, being merciful, being pure in heart, and being peacemakers be your definition of the good life? And would these be the attitudes that would help you want to achieve your definition of success? In my opinion, the attributes described in the Beatitudes are certainly not the traits that our culture rewards. Today, we're going to take a close look at the first Beatitude. The Beatitudes are part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is a summary of the gospel and all of Jesus' teachings on what the good life is all about, how to get life to the full, 
life in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes describe the attributes that people in God's kingdom will display and how they will, how they will act. God's kingdom, where we live the blessed life or life to the full according to Jesus, has often been called the upside down kingdom. Everything Jesus teaches about the blessed life is contradictory to that in earthy kingdoms. It's so hard to practice Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount that Christianity has often ignored them, called them impractical and unrealistic, and claimed they were only meant to describe how people would behave in God's kingdom after Jesus returns. I believe the Bible actually expects us, you and me, to display the Beatitudes in our lives right here, right now, and to obey his teachings in all situations, no matter how difficult it seems to be to translate his teachings in a meaningful way into our own lives, 2,000 years after they were spoken. Theologians like Walter Wink or Martin Luther King have done so and made them seem so much more assertive than we often understand them and thereby allow us to be advocates for good causes and not to be doormats as a superficial reading of the Beatitudes might suggest. Yes, it's difficult to translate the implications of the Sermon on the Mount for us today, but we must do so because I believe Jesus expected us to practice what he taught. But translating it to action or attitudes is difficult. For instance, Jesus says, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So what was your response the last time you encountered a homeless person? Yes, I know we can all rationalize our responses but are we meeting the spirit in which Jesus spoke those words? Humanly, it's very difficult or impossible to follow all the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. That's why many of these teachings have often been ignored or explained away. But remember, I said humanly it's impossible. With God, all is possible. Today, as John said, we will only examine the first beatitude closely, but it has direct implications for all the beatitudes and the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. To help us understand the first beatitude, we need to look at the setting in which Jesus taught it. Jesus went throughout Galilee, Syria, Jerusalem, and Judea, teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of diseases. Because of his remarkable teachings and his performance of miracles, large crowds gathered to follow him. The crowds saw the lame walk, demonic spirits released, the joy of forgiven sinners, release from pain, seizures, and paralysis. And they witnessed troubled minds coming to peace. The crowds being largely made up of those that were shunned by respectful society probably also included beggars and prostitutes. Today, the crowd might well have included the homeless and the addicted. The great crowd composed of broken, hurting, scared, searching, and even some supposedly successful people by earthly standards, all longed for something more. Many in this motley crowd were like many people today at the end of their rope, knowing they were helpless, desperate, and had little hope. But maybe, maybe they were thinking, perhaps, perhaps this Jesus Jesus, seeing the crowds, went up a mountainside and sat down. The disciples and the crowd followed him. Going up the mountain brings echoes of Moses 
going up Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, teachings from God. Here, Jesus delivers even greater teachings, teachings that will expand and clarify those of the Old Testament. He is proclaiming that the kingdom has come. He's proclaiming the good news that in him and through him, you can enter God's kingdom, the blessed life. The good news is that in, in and because of Jesus, the long-awaited reign of heaven is breaking in upon the earth. Eternal life is available. The good news is not only that our sins are forgiven and that we'll go to heaven, but that his kingdom is breaking into our world and that the crowds following Jesus and we are all invited to enter it. What is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a society where God's will is as perfectly done on earth as it is in heaven. That means that only they who do God's will will enter his kingdom. Jesus' miracles of healing and feeding demonstrate his power, his care for all the suffering, and that in his kingdom, all needs will be met, not necessarily all their wants, but every essential need. The rewards or met needs are often not material or physical, but spiritual and exist in the very relationship with God. However, God's kingdom hasn't fully arrived yet. That happens with the second coming of Jesus. In the meantime, there will still be suffering, illness, and pain. Nevertheless, those in God's kingdom will feel richly blessed because living the Beatitudes will draw them ever closer to God and into an ever deeper knowledge of him. The Beatitudes, although not easy to understand, explain how this happens. Back to Jesus on the mountain. While it's true that Jesus is teaching most directly to his disciples, those, those are the ones who are committed to him. The crowd a little further away can also hear him. And they too are invited into the kingdom. How startled the disciples and the desperate crowd made up of the ill, paralyzed, poor and lame must have been to hear Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those seeking righteousness. Is this what it means to experience a good life? Really? How confused many of them must have been. How upside down this is compared to what most people think of as a good life. Today, we're looking only at the first attitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are looking at this beatitude because it explains how one enters God's kingdom and because the other Beatitudes are directly connected to it. The Beatitudes cannot be taken apart. They all belong together. We know this because the attitudes begin and end with the same promise of possessing the kingdom of heaven. The, Be the Beatitudes are bracketed in this way. The Beatitudes, the word comes from Latin beatus, meaning happy or blessed, are pronouncements of divine blessing. The term blessed is macarius in Latin. The word describes those to whom God spoke as privileged recipients of God's favor. Many translations use blessed for macarius, but no word, English word does complete justice to its meaning. Happy is too weak because happiness comes and goes with circumstances. Peter Kreeft says, blessedness is an objective state. It matters not how I feel about myself and my condition, but how God feels about me and my condition. 
It refers to how God assesses us. When I'm blessed, it's because God is pleased with me. And the, so the term also suggests fortunate, approved, congratulations, right side up, joyful and hopeful. This poor in spirit are blessed because they are right with God. They're approved by God. And because of this approval, they are secure, confident, joyful, hopeful, and happy. This is not a momentary feeling of happiness, but a steady feeling of well-being and security. Blessed speaks of happiness founded not upon happenings or circumstances, but upon a joy rooted in the deep source of God's grace. To enter the kingdom of God, you need to be poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is one of the nine attributes you will display if you are one of God's people, if you are part of God's kingdom. These qualities like meekness, mourning, hungering, and thirsting for righteousness are not qualities you strive to have, but qualities that you have when you are one of those who have entered his kingdom. All nine Beatitudes are tied together. According to John Chrysostom, he, Jesus, hath woven a sort of golden chain for us with the Beatitudes. Thus, first, he, he that is humble will surely also mourn for his own sins. He that so mourns will be both meek and righteous and merciful. That he is merciful and righteous and contrite will of course be also pure in heart and such a one will be a peacemaker as well. Those in the kingdom of heaven will display all nine characteristics. Only those who are poor in spirit will be in God's kingdom. What does Jesus actually mean by the poor in spirit? Uh, poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of spiritual bankruptcy. When we see the glory of Jesus as he really is and the glory of the new world order that he brings into being, we become aware of how far we have fallen, how poor we are. Being poor in spirit is the conscious confession of unworthiness before God, the deepest form of repentance, utterly without moral worth. Being emptied of self-righteousness and moral self-esteem, we are ready to be filled ready to enter into life in the kingdom. When we realize how little control we have of our lives, how dependent everything we possess and all that we have accomplished is and was dependent on God, we are ready to empty ourselves of our self-interests and open ourselves to God. Let him have control of our lives and trust him fully. Being poor in spirit isn't advocating material poverty. Such poverty is never praised in the Bible. However, when we are well off materially, when we are seen as powerful and accomplished, when we have lots of friends, there is a temptation to think that we deserve these because we are good people and not by the grace of God. We might even think that when we have these things, they are a testimony of our standing with God. Many years ago, Betty and I were on holidays in San Francisco. It was a beautiful evening and we were just leaving a restaurant where we had had a delicious dinner in the company of some of our good friends. It had been a great evening. We'd only walked a few steps in the peaceful twilight of evening when a homeless man came pushing a shopping cart and approached us. Betty and our friends kept walking, but I, for some reason, stopped. The homeless man was dressed in ragged and dirty clothes, 
But he looked me hopefully in the eye and said, can I sing you a song? Well, I thought, this is a different approach for begging. So I said, sure. Well, this disheveled young man sang the most beautiful rendition of his Eyes on the Sparrow that I have ever heard. I was moved to tears. I dug into my pocket for some change and asked him, did you used to go to church? He gave me a look of pity and asked, why did you ask? Used to. I go all the time. His words cut me to the heart. What a terrible assumption lay behind my question. Did I think because I was better off materially than him that I was closer to God? What arrogance on my part. Who was closer to God if being in his kingdom depended on realizing that we put our whole trust in God when we realize that our own utter helplessness, our own utter ignorance, and our own utter inability to cope with life so that we put everything in God's hands. When we trust in God instead of our own abilities, it gives us the courage to display the attributes found in the Beatitudes and to obey the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. When everything depends on oneself, one has a tendency to hold onto things for fear of losing them. When you trust God, you can let go. You can trust him to fill your empty hand. When you trust God, you can mourn for the injustice in the world and you can strive to end them because you are relying on God's power. You can be generous to other people because you, got, you trust God to treat you generously. You can be gentle or meek because God will grant you the earth. You will have spiritual insight because your motives are focused on God. You will no longer fearfully cling to worldly things because you possess all the real security you need. Jesus. Again, the qualities described in the Beatitudes are not attributes you strive for, to be accepted by Jesus, but a way of being that is developed because of your relationship with Jesus. Jesus called ordinary people, broken people like us, to himself and into his kingdom. As a result of contact with him, as a result of submission to his rule, the qualities he blesses begin to appear in lives and will appear in yours. The poor in spirit trust Jesus because they know Jesus is in the midst of their own suffering. Because they are suffering his sorrows too, they will also be led by him to his fulfillments and his blessings. It is precisely the empty hands that will be blessed because now God has a chance to work in them. When they, when they hold the hand of God, they will learn the fabulous certainty with which we can step into the uncertainties of every succeeding day. Jesus continually called us to repent, to believe and to trust at an ever deeper level. As we do so, we are gradually turned right side up in an upside down world. I'm sure some of you are thinking, really, John, those are just pretty words. No, God really does act in our suffering. Helmut Tillichy describes it this way. We have the signed statement sealed by the sufferings of God, of Christ that now those who go aimlessly stumbling through life are literally surrounded with joyful surprises because they will learn on this one, one condition that they really dare to trust God. They will learn how God is always there, that his help is supplied with an almost incredible punctuality. They learn how he sends the sense send some person to help us up again 
how he allows us to catch some word, which need not even be in the Bible, to which we cling, how he brings money into the house and bread to our table, and how in the hour of our greatest sorrow, he may perhaps send the laughter of a little child. He who dares to live in this way, in the name of this miracle, in the name of this opened heaven, will see the glory of God, the comforting stars of God shining in the darkest valleys of their life, and will wait with all the expectancy of a child for the next morning where the father will be waiting with his surprises. For God is always positive. He makes all things new. And the lighted windows of the father's house shine brightest in the far country where all our blessings have been lost. Blessed are you not because the far country cannot take away from you the dream of home and better times to come. No, blessed are you because the door is really open. It's really and truly open. And the Father's hand is stretched out to you as long as he who came in the name of the Father stands among us and proclaims, nay, fulfills the words, blessed are you. I challenge everyone at this Zoom meeting to read the Sermon on the Mount this week and mark all the passages which you think are not realistic and you therefore aren't obeying. I'm convinced that if you read the Sermon on the Mount carefully and take Jesus' teachings as meant to be practiced today, and look at how sacrificially Jesus lived, you will realize you can't live like that under your own power. To live like that, you must realize how poor in spirit you are and how much you need the wisdom and power of God. By admitting your shortcomings and trusting in God, you have God's kingdom. You will be blessed and secure no matter how threatening your circumstances at the moment, because you know that you have God's approval and you have God's love. Amen. Welcome to do so. Uh, but uh, let us close the service, the formal part of the service with this benediction. Whether you are mourning or joyful, poor or rich in spirit, at peace or in trouble, may you be blessed by Christ this week. In all your working and playing, your resting and your praying, may you hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. May you be merciful and gracious in all your relationships. And may you give the blessings of God as generously as you have received them. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>